Section 9.6, significance tests for a mean. As a reminder, a significance test for a population mean is often referred to as a one sample t-test for mu or simply a one sample t-test. Abby and Raquel love to eat subs. Their favorite restaurant has a six inch sub option, but they suspect it's actually shorter than the advertised length. So they randomly select 24 different times during the next month and order this six inch sub. Here we have a data set showing the lengths of all these subs. Does this data give us convincing evidence at the alpha equals 10% level that the sandwiches at this restaurant are shorter than advertised on average? Next, we'll plan out our hypothesis test by identifying which inference method we'll be using and checking the conditions. So we'll be conducting a one sample t-test for mu, for a mean. We have a randomly selected sample, uh, and the 24 subs that were selected is less than 10% of all subs made by this restaurant. Now we don't have a sample size that's large enough because this is less than 30, uh, and it doesn't note anything about the sample coming from a population that's approximately normal. So we would make a graphical display of our data. Here we made a dot plot, and we can see that that's approximately normal. We have that peak in the center. We don't have any strong outliers or skews. So we'll say that it's okay that we have a small sample because we're not seeing any skew in the results of that sample. Now we go ahead and calculate all the math for the problem. We would start off by going to Staplet and putting in all 24 values to find the average sub length. In this case, it's 5.677 inches and standard deviation of the 24 subs. We calculate our test statistic and it's always worth repeating that the null hypothesis value of mu equals six is gonna come after that minus sign. The X bar comes first and that difference gets divided by S over radical N. We get a t-score of negative 2.41, and then we jump to our green table to look that value up and find a p-value. We go to 23 degrees of freedom, one less than the sample size, and everything on this table is positive, so we just consider this a positive 2.41, and we would find that value in between 2.069 and 2.50. Uh, so our p-value is somewhere in this range of 1% and 2.5%. That's enough for information for us to make a conclusion. Because the p-value is between 0.01 and 0.025, we can reject the null hypothesis because both of those values are less than the significance level of 10%. There's convincing evidence that the mean length of all six inch subs at this restaurant is actually less than six inches. So let's talk about what a p-value actually tells us. Now on this slide, it's gonna use a, uh, a p-value that was calculated from technology. So instead of having a range of 0.01 to 0.025, it's calculated it as a more specific 0.012. Uh, and that p-value tells us that there's about a 0.012 or a 1.2% probability of getting a random sample of 24 subs that have an average of 5.677 inches if the null hypothesis is true, and that's a key part. So in a distribution where um, this restaurant chain is telling the truth, their, their subs actually do average six inches, this result will happen that often, a p-value often. Now this is unlikely because it's less than 5%, or for the problem we, problem we were just working with, it's less than 10% because that was our alpha level. And that allows us to rule out that initial null hypothesis and say that this is unlikely enough to occur that we think that they're actually being misleading when they say the average sub length is six inches. 
Now, while this chapter is on hypothesis tests, we can use confidence intervals to evaluate claims as well. Let's say we had a 99% confidence interval for mu. And when we make the boundaries of that interval, it doesn't include that null hypothesis value. So in this case, let's say that the subs are actually a little over six inches. At six inches isn't in the interval, maybe it goes from 6.3 to 6.6. .6. Okay, since that value is not in the interval, we would be able to reject a null hypothesis at a 1% significance level. That 1% comes from whatever's left over uh, from the confidence level. If we made the in, uh, confidence interval and we found that that six was in that range, let's say maybe it went from 5.9 to 6.4, okay, six is within that range, then we would fail to reject based on that 1% significance level. In the children's game, don't break the ice. There are a whole bunch of small pl uh, plastic ice cubes that average 30 millimeters. We want to make sure this game is working well. So a supervisor inspects a random sample of 50 cubes from the most recent hour uh, and measures their width, the 95% confidence interval for the interval of mu representing the mean width of all cubes produced in the last hour gives the interval from 29.97 to 30.043. Based on this interval, what conclusion would we make for a hypothesis test where the null value is mu equals 30, and the alternative is that it's not equal to 30. Okay, it also gives us an alpha level here of 5%. So as we had just gone over, we don't actually have to complete a full hypothesis test for this because we have the confidence interval. So the 95% confidence interval contains mu equals 30. It went from 29.997 to 30.043, because 30 is in that range, we fail to reject the null hypothesis at that 5% alpha level. Now, the alpha level that it gives us in the problem needs to match what the confidence interval is. So if this were say a 90% confidence interval instead of a 95%, we wouldn't be able to conduct our test like this. Uh, our second sentence is the same as it's always been. It's always about that alternative hypothesis. And since we fail to reject, we do not have convincing evidence that the mean width of all plastic ice cubes produced in this hour differs from 30 millimeters. Now, if we actually went through the mechanics of a hypothesis test, this would be confirmed by, by our p-value. So we had an x-bar of 30.002 with a standard deviation of 0 0.08 and we could use that to find a test statistic, 1.77. When we look that up on our table with 49 degrees of freedom, we would find a p-value of 0 0.0829. That's calculated with technology, so it gives us a specific value. Uh, if we were working with our table, it would be somewhere between 5 and 10%. Uh, and because that is greater than our alpha level of 0.05, we would fail to reject the null hypothesis, which is the same conclusion we drew when we looked at the confidence interval. Now let's see what happens when we change that confidence interval. So instead of 95%, we're gonna use 90%. So if we did a 90% confidence interval, we would have 10% left over, 5% on the right, 5% on the left. So when we conduct our, our hypothesis test or evaluate a hypothesis, it's going to use a 10% alpha level. Because the p-value is less than 10%, that 0 0.0829, we would reject that null hypothesis. So at the 10% level, we do have convincing evidence that the mean width of all plastic cubes produced this hour differs from 30 millimeters. A 90% confidence would not contain that value of 30. It would probably just miss it. Maybe it would go from 30.001 to 30.039. Okay, just made up values, but the point being that 30 is not going to be in a 90% confidence interval because we are rejecting the null hypothesis since that p-value is less than the alpha level. When we collect our data, we find that the sample statistic, the average of our sample is 7.5 days with a standard deviation of 0.9. When we calculate the test statistic, we get a t-score of negative 1.76 and a p-value 0.04. Now this question is asking us uh, 
to answer something different, saying why is this a statistically significant result, but not practically important. So the p-value of 4%, 0.04, is less than the alpha level, less than 0.05. So that makes this result statistically significant. This cream is helping cuts heal faster. However, it's not practically important because without the cream, uh, without using any kind of uh, cream at all, it takes 7.6 days for a cut to heal. And using the cream lowers that to 7.5 days. That's such a small difference that even though it is statistically significant and is helpful, it's probably not worth the trouble uh, to apply this cream, cream only to have uh, these scabs heal one-tenth of a day sooner.